Sean, you're putting the you're putting the announcements in the group meeting. Okay, good. good, good. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to give a short no in the Zoom. I was trying to get the audio fixed. <laughs> so, okay. I don't know. I rebooted the computer and uh, and uh, unhooked stuff and hooked it back in and it worked. You guys can hear me better than you could before, right? All right, good. Um, so, when the water's polluted, where do you go? Where do you go for uh, fresh water, for the pure water? Upstream, it's the uh, picture here. I also, it, ca it came to me this past week, um, we had the overlying theme for the minor prophets. Anybody remember that? Either Mike or or Larry. <laughs> okay. Right. So, sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs fourteen thirty four. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> but um, the uh, so we had an overlying theme for the minor prophets, and I don't know why I didn't think to do this, but probably because I it didn't think to have an overlying theme for the Minor Prophets in the first place. That was somebody else's idea. But uh, we're going to have one for this study on the Eternal Kingdom. And uh, you're going to memorize that just as you, you guys apparently did from the Minor Prophets. Uh, you're going you're gonna to have this in your head by the end. Um, Jeremiah 6.16 Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways... And see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Kind of reminds me of that, what we were saying. Uh, if, you're, if you don't, if the water's polluted, polluted in the river, you go upstream to find where it was polluted, you get the water before it gets there. Um, so Jeremiah, speaking in a time where there was idolatry, a rampant idolatry in Israel and he's pleading with them to seek the old paths before all this perverted stuff was introduced all this stuff that polluted God's message and, and got what God had um, delivered to them before that came into the picture go back before then and be a picture of that uh, and so that's our my, uh, overlying theme uh, Jeremiah 6.16 6, I think it fits we're talking about the uh, the first few lessons of this uh, speak of the beginning of the church we've already talked about how that our Lord came during a time that was just perfect the fullness of time uh, Galatians 4.14 it, it was the exact right moment for our Lord to come to this earth uh, and to fulfill his mission and to establish his church and that's why Paul calls it the fullness of time. Um, so we kind of got into this uh, last week, but we're going to talk about lesson two based on chapter two of that book, uh, historical evidence concerning the life of Christ. And we talked uh, just by way of introduction how the, that men, when they write historical accounts, they don't get everything right all the time, do they? They could be an eyewitness to something and they can still interpret what they see differently than, than what someone else that was present might interpret it as. So um, we, we want to keep that in mind when we read of these men. We also know, and we discuss this, that men have agendas when they write things a lot of the time. If, if you have a dog in the fight uh, when you're writing about a certain historical event, you're going to write it a certain way than somebody who has the different dog in the fight. And so you want to keep that in mind. 
we're going to be looking at some accounts here uh, that are taken by men close to the period during the life of Christ and definitely in the first century uh, where uh, the, the first century church was. And these people didn't have a perfect understanding of who Christ was. And they may have known about Christ, but didn't accept him as the son of God. That We'll talk about the first guy that we're going to talk about is in that camp. Um, and uh, this shouldn't surprise us because a lot of men were face to face with Christ and didn't, didn't accept him as the son of God, did they? A lot of men saw miracles performed in front of them and didn't accept him as the son of God. But uh, so these men here didn't, ex didn't exactly accept him as a son of God. However, they reveal to us that our Lord was being spoken of in the first century. Uh, he was a topic of discussion, um, and therefore it's evident he was a historical person. They wouldn't all be talking about him if he, were, if he didn't exist. Make sense? And they, they wouldn't be talking about his people either if they didn't exist in the first century. So we're going to look into uh, the writings of these men, and the first one we're going to look at here is Flavius Josephus. Anybody heard that name, Josephus? Um, probably heard, heard that uh, mentioned a few times because he's an a early Jewish historian, if you could call him that. Before that, he was a general. Uh, but he was born in 37 or 38 AD to one by the name of Matthias. And uh, when the great Jewish revolt broke out, uh, which happened in 66 uh, after, after Christ, um, or AD, uh, the Jerusalemite aristocracy, those in, in control of Jerusalem at the time, appointed him the military governor over Galilee and, uh, in order to prepare them for the Romans coming in. This is 66 uh, AD. And in 67, uh, the Romans had them surrounded, had uh, Josephus and his uh, forces surrounded in Yodfat is the name of the, the city. 47 days they had him uh, and them stuck. And he and about 40 other officers fled and hid in a cave somewhere. And they were uh, taking a vote on what to do. They had two choices. They were going to surrender to the Romans or they were going to enter into a suicide pact. And they would uh, draw lots to determine who was going to uh, kill the other. So it weren't, wasn't exactly a suicide, but uh, you may have heard of the circle problem of uh, men like so-and-so kills the next guy next to him, and uh, the problem is you're supposed to do the math according to the number in the circle to be the last guy so that you're not, <laughs> you're, you don't have to. Well, that kind of happened with Josephus. I don't know if it's based off of that, but Josephus, uh, he voted against, he says he voted against suicide and instead voted to surrender to the Romans, but he was outnumbered. And so they did their thing. Uh, one killed the other, the other um, uh, and uh, somebody else killed him and so forth until it was just Josephus and one other man left. And they both agreed, well, this is kind of dumb. <laughs> let's, uh, let's surrender to the Romans. And that's what they did. And so uh, Josephus surrendered to Vespasian. And then what he does with Vespasian is um, either cowardly or it's uh, smart. He, he buttered him up. He flattered him by claiming that he received this divine revelation from God. Um, and he told him Vespasian is going to be the next emperor of Rome. So uh, Vespasian liked that. And... Uh, this likely saved Josephus' life. And uh, after, and this is from the myth of Masada, because a similar thing happened in, in Masada in the fortress there. But uh, he says, this likely saved his life. After two and a half years as a Roman prisoner, when the Roman Senate proclaimed Vespasian emperor and Josephus' prophecy was thusly proven true, the historian was released from ca captivity. So they called it a prophecy in that book. I uh, wouldn't necessarily call it that. It was probably a very good guess by Josephus. So his life was spared, 
and then he is respected by the Romans. Uh, and he was so respected that he was with Titus when uh, the, when the, not the Titus we know of, but the Roman Titus, the general, when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And uh, what he did, here we go, who was he? We, that's what we've been talking about. And uh, what he did is um, he wrote of his experiences and historical knowledge in seven books entitled History of the Jewish War and also wrote Jewish Antiquities as well as his own autobiography. And uh, we actually know of the Jews' mass suicide at Masada from him. Now, whether or not he's a credible source has been debated um, because he also said that Masada was constructed out of marble and it clearly wasn't. You can, you can see the remains today. Um, anyways, there is um, there's a lot of talk about his credibility. I, I've mentioned this in the Minor Prophets. There's a whole episode dedicated to Flavius Josephus or, or rather Masada and talking about Josephus, his account of it, in uh, the what you call the naked archaeologist is what it's called, where he's not actually naked. He's, calls, he's called the naked archaeologist because he strips, he says he strips all the, uh, the uh, I don't know what he says. He just starts from scratch and tries to figure out what happened in archaeology, basically. Um, so there's a whole episode, and I wouldn't endorse everything you read or, or watch on, on that television show because there's a lot of it that's just crazy. He tries to um, explain naturally the Red Sea parting for one, so just uh, you got to be careful what you, what you watch with him. But anyways, um, so he wrote of these things, and in his writings he wrote of Jesus. And See highlighted paragraph on page 31. I, don't, I forgot my book today, but I, I have the important stuff in this slide. And whatever book you guys have, it's going to be a different page, I think. But uh, what did he have to say? First off, at that time a man appeared, if he can be called a man. His nature and his body were human, but his appearance was more than human. He performed miracles through some invisible power. Some said of him that he was our first lawgiver, Moses, risen from the dead, and others thought that he was sent by God. I personally, in view of this whole life, should not call him a messenger of God. Now, what I was going to read in, in the, uh, in, on page 31 of that book is a different translation of this. This is the, uh, what do you call it, the... Um, There's a different, it's probably also on page 31. <laughs> There's a different translation there um, that I, the, whose name escapes me that, that, that is this translation, translation that's probably closer to the truth. Uh, the, the other translation, which you'll see a lot of people use, states that uh, he says, now this is the Christ uh, and something, something to that effect, which I personally raise my eyebrows at when I hear that a Jew, a Jewish man, said, this is the Christ. A, a Jew would never say that. But there is another translation. I believe somebody got a hold of it during translation and translated it that with an agenda to say, see, he's talking about Christ. Um, which you can look at this quote here and see he's talking about Christ, right? You, you don't have to have him say that he is the Christ. Um, but Anyway, he, he describes, he's describing, I need to back up here, his whole point in writing these things is to provide a um, case before the Roman Empire uh, to spare the Jewish way of life and uh, Jewish traditions and, and so forth. And so he's making a case for the Jews. It don't, you know, spare them, spare their way of life, basically. And so he's going through the history of the Jews, and guess who comes up? in the history of the Jews. Christ does. So, we, But he says there, and I believe that would be what a Jew would say in this time especially, I personally, in view of his whole life, should not call him a messenger of God. Guess what he's doing, though? He's 
admitting he lived, that, that he existed. And he's like, uh, he was a general for the, the Jews over Jerusalem at least 33 years after Christ's death. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. There were definitely people in Josephus' time, and that he knew of them, that, that, that uh, believed he was a messenger of God. And of course, he gives his take on it. You, you don't have it, do you? <laughs> okay. I see you brought Josephus out, but I didn't put the uh, references to Josephus in here. Should have. Uh, I believe it was treated like just about everything else where it was, you know, copied and copied and copied. I mean, um, even the, uh, even if I understand correctly, the Iliad and Homer's Odyssey several manuscripts and they a lot of them don't match up they're different so um that that could be where they were going with uh, in the book when they were talking about the different translations yes sir right right what Right, right, exactly. Yeah, he, could, he couldn't admit, if, if he were a Christian, I would argue he would admit it, but, uh, um, and we'll talk a bit later about what the Christians in that, in that time went through, but um, I don't believe he'd call himself a Jew if he, if he believed that Jesus was the Christ. Um, he, I think he said something else. Oh, nope. Uh, let me go back and make sure we got everything with Josephus. All right. So he didn't dispute the fact that he was a wise man, if he could be called the man. He didn't. He uh, didn't dispute the the uh, that he had done many marvel marvelous works um, or many wonderful works. And uh, even, in, I don't have it up there, but he described his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. And uh, we will note Eusebius, a, uh, a uh, early Christian, um, quoted him twice by 315 AD. So he knew of Josephus and found some credibility in him. And uh, here it is, the North Slavic manuscript of his writings, the North Slavic is the manuscript that that uh, quotation was taken from. So uh, it's likely that some early person tried to improve his statements. Like he didn't say that, uh, but uh, some in, in rewriting the manuscript tried to improve upon it. Any questions or comments? It's Josephus. Confirming that there was a man by the name of Christ or that and described him perfectly here. And then on that, on that same vein, and we'll kind of look into some other guys that talk about it too, but just think about your friends who are not members of the church, and, or they're in the denominational world, they're, they're not religious at all. Just think about them. How would they describe the church? And would they get it right? They, they'd get some things wrong, wouldn't they? Because um, uh, kind of have to 
believe that if they understood it all, they'd probably join. <laughs> but, uh, but who knows? We have Tacitus. Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus, who was he? He was a Roman historian that lived from 56 AD to 120 AD. And uh, he wrote Annals and Histories, some kind of vague, broad uh, names, but I guess he was the only one writing Roman history at the time. So he, he wrote Annals and Histories and is regarded as the greatest Roman historian uh, by modern scholars. And his work covered the history of the Roman Empire from the death of Augustus, that's uh, 14 AD, to uh, the death of Domitian uh, in 96 AD. And uh, he had a strong uh, dislike for the Christians, uh, did not like them. Uh, however, wouldn't that strengthen his testimony uh, that he was aware, well, we'll, we'll talk about what he, what he said, but uh, it strengthens his testimony that he didn't like it because he's, he's not biased towards the church, and yet he's going to say some of the things uh, that he said. And so he's writing that uh, he wrote, he's just writing, for the most part, somewhat objective history here. He wrote that Nero set fire to Rome and placed the blame on the Christians, and he labeled Christianity as a pernicious superstition that resulted from the sentencing of Christus, one by the name of Christus. Um, so it doesn't sound like he likes Christianity, but he's here confirming that he knows about it, in confirming the, the head of Christianity even. What do you have to say? He says, but neither all human help nor the liber liberality of the emperor, he's talking about Nero, nor all the atonements presented to the gods availed to abate the infamy he lay under having, uh, under of having ordained the city to be set on fire. You've all heard about Ro Rome being burned by Nero, right? That he, he's the one that set fire to it. To suppress, therefore, this common rumor, Nero procured others to be accused and inflicted exquisite punishment upon those people who were in abhorrence of their crimes and were commonly known by the name of Christians. So he's here in um, writing between 56 AD and 120 AD and uh, actually only wrote up to uh, 96 AD in the, uh, as far as the history of Rome goes. But here he's saying, he's, he's naming Christians. He also says, they had their denomination from Christus, who in the reign of Tiberius was put to death as a criminal by the procurator um, Pontius Pilate. This pernicious superstition, though checked for a while, broke out again and spread not only over Judea, but the source of this evil, but reached the city also, whither flow from all quarters all things vile and shameful, and where they find shelter and encouragement. So he, he doesn't like the Christians. So we're kind of getting that point here. Um, so, okay. You see that, and I got the impression that he looked at the Christians as in just another denomination of the Jews. Um, and he, he calls it, their, they had their denomination from Christus. That, that is, they broke off from uh, the Jewish religion, so they're just Jews, they're just a different denomination, is his mindset. So he got, he got it wrong there. But he's here, again, confirming the existence of a Christ uh, that many were following in the first century, even after his execution. Um, so though he, he regarded them as worthy to be punished, uh, he, dis, he does describe Nero's treatment of them as a way of gratifying the cruelty of one man. Uh, so just, uh, just to gratify Nero's cruelty is why he was doing this. And Part of that, he probably hated them before he blamed the Ro burning of Rome uh, on them. But uh, he did many cruel things. You've probably heard of them. Uh, they were covered with animal skins, and they were torn to pieces by dogs. Uh, they were daubed over with uh, combustible uh, material. 
and uh, they were set up on poles. You've probably heard of that, uh, how they lit his gardens. The Christians were uh, put up on poles and just ignited, and uh, they were degraded and used in his circuses. And so his testimony, Tacitus's, uh, reveals several things about his understanding of Christianity. He, that Christ is the founder of the denomination, he calls them, of Christians. Um, Christ was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate. He, uh, we read that in scripture, don't we? Confirms that. His uh, death took place while Ti Tiberius was emperor, therefore he was born under the reign of Augustus. Uh, he also says Christianity began in Judea and was suppressed for a time. The law shall go forth from where? Jerusalem, right? Um, so he, he's here confirming that. Um, and uh, the vast multitudes were executed to gratify the cruelty of one man. Um, so he, he uh, recognized, Tacitus does, that they're innocent of the crimes uh, ag charged against them. But he still didn't like him. So that's Tacitus. What's really important about uh, these men is really important that he uh, uh, disliked them. Mm -hmm. It's really important because you're, you're listening to a man who's writing who would not, would not tell the truth or would twist it to whatever benefited him. Right. He's not exactly mourning over them. Uh, he is saying they were innocent of what he, they were charged of, but uh, he's not exactly mourning that what's happened to them has happened to them. No, he's not mourning for them at all. It's valuable as opposed to a guy who believed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. also that person would twist it to make sure that what he was saying was accurate. Right. He is accidentally saying accurate. Yeah, <laughs> accidentally. Yes, sir. That was the last bell, wasn't it? Any other comments or questions? One thing that is interesting about that is the thing that seems to change. For a while, you could read Dawson's column oh, yeah. press, and maybe he had, didn't care about it until things made it. Mm hmm. They, they who were sc scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word we read of in Acts. And Very true. In fact, they, if it had rose out of that, they'd probably support it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, next week, we will talk about this guy, um, Suetonius. Um, and uh, Suetonius uh, authored the 12 Caesars, and uh, we'll see how that corresponds with what we read of in uh, Acts chapter 18 and verse 2. Uh, so I appreciate everybody's attention.